Shalom, everyone. Okay, so some of you know we are going live. So, boy, <laughs> this lighting is terrible at night. It's great during the day. Um, anyway, so we're going live. I said we would go through the Book of Romans. If you are not able to meet to be here tonight with the live, remember it should be posted on the page tomorrow. So some of you might be able to make it. Some of you might not be able to make it. I know we had talked about this. I sent out a message to some of you that we would be doing this tonight. And so I get it though. Some of you are, Shalom, Elizabeth, Alicia. Um, some of you are not going to be able to make the live, but we're going to go through the book of Romans. So I want to go through the book of Romans tonight because I, I have a podcast on the book of Galatians. And the father had told me last week we need to go through Romans to try to help people understand it is not against the law. It upholds the Torah. And so, um, hi Truman, hi Shawnee. So what we want to do is wait a few minutes because I put out a message earlier. I didn't put it on my page because I was too busy, but I did send out some messages to people that were going to be doing a live. Hi Cherry. Um, <laughs> yay! I know, I like did it right at nine. I've been working my little bum bum off. I had 48 sessions in the last two months of, for photography. That's insane. That's insane for one person. <laughs> it's just absolutely insane. So anyway, guys, we're going to go through the book of Romans tonight. Um, feel, feel free to ask questions. Um, we're going to just really dive into it. And if you have not listened to my podcast, God's Little Hummingbird, please do so if you do not understand the book of Galatians because that beyond a shadow of a doubt proves that Galatians does not speak against the Torah. And we are not, just remember, we're not a religion. We are not a religion. We just follow the whole Bible um, by blood. My family were Jewish Levites. We were Levites. So we were Jewish, just Southern Kingdom of Israel. But we are not Judaism at all. We follow the Torah and we are not against anybody. We don't hate Christians. We don't hate those. We don't hate those in Judaism. We want everybody just to come out of Babylon and see the truth. So that's where we're at. Um, I know that uh, there's Kelly. Hi, Shalom Kelly. I know a few other people might join here. We're going to start in Romans chapter one, get as much as we can through. I have been up since 3.30 this morning <laughs> and it is nine o'clock. So my brain, we're praying for God's intervention. <laughs> I, I can make it. Like I usually am up till about 11. Hello, shalom, Andy. Um, okay, so Romans, Romans, Romans. Everybody have your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, did you know that you can go online for free and get the Blue Letter Bible? It's really cool too because the Blue Letter Bible um, and Bible Hub, you can, um, you can, uh, yeah, you can click on the words and see the little um, definitions and stuff. In fact, it's B, the one I like is blbclassic.org. The reason I do the classic.org is because it's the old one and I'm old. <laughs> and I've been doing the Blue Letter Bible for 20 some years and I don't like updated new things. I like the things how I used to use them. <laughs> so I know I'm, but you know, when you're almost 50, you get a, you can do that. You can have your ways where you just like, I just, you know what I mean? Okay. So Romans chapter one, I'm going to, I'm going to pull it up on both places so that, I, um, if I have anything I need to share, what in the world? Okay. Romans. Okay. Guys, turn your Bibles to Romans, please. Um, does anybody by, by the way, God bless you, sister. Thank you. Shalom, Jennifer. Um, and so, yes, I just, let's go to the New King James Version Bible. I'm waiting for, did anybody see Danielle yet? Hi, Carissa. Um, I know she was putting her children down to bed and then wanted to join. Um, she'll be here. Um, and okay, does anybody have any prayer requests while we're waiting for just a minute? Um, anybody need anything right now? Because this is a good time to pray. In fact, um, hi Lee, Corley, Shalom. Um, we're going to start reading in Romans. We're going to go through the book of Romans today together. Um, and I'm going to, yeah, I'm just giving a minute here. Um, is this too loud if I turn on my little heater? You guys listen for a minute. Is that too loud? Is that distracting? 
Can somebody like tell me, is that distracting or not? Do you hear it? Is it, cause it makes me nice and warm. <laughs> it's like, I like it, but I don't need it. And if it's distracting, I don't want it to be there. Um, okay, so, okay. I don't see Danielle, so we're just gonna start. And I didn't see any prayer requests, so I do pray that Father God, please open our eyes, ears, and hearts to your truth. Yahweh God, please never let us think anything or see anything that's not of you, but please give us insight that you would want us to have. Father, be glorified, and Yeshua, please come teach us. In the name of Yeshua, amen. Um, we did have a conversation today. I do want to point this out. Um, somebody brought up the pronunciation pronunciations of Yahusha and Yahua. I do not like to get into the arguing <laughs> over the pronunciation of the names. I will explain quickly why I use the name Yahweh. So, if you look at ancient manuscripts, the very first manuscript that has vowel points was found from some of the Samaritans, which were the northern tribes of Israel mixed in with the Assyrians, correct? And so this tribe, um, Nehemiah Gordon has more information, I can't remember, but what the name of them, them are, but they were some of the Samaritans. And they went up through, so 730, hi Donna, shalom. Um, they went up north of Israel. And so remember the Samaritans were half-breeds of the northern tribes of Israel and the Assyrians. And that's in the Bible. Remember when Yeshua comes to the woman at the well and she says, our father Jacob drank from this well. Well, she was an Israelite because Jacob was her father. But she said, then you Jews have nothing to do with us. That's because that was the southern kingdom, right? The southern kingdom of the Jews, they got to remain in the land and the northern kingdom got dispersed and kicked out because of their idolatry. Anyway, in this village, in the first century manuscripts, they have found the pronunciation with vowel points of Yahweh in that language. And it literally pronounced it as Yahweh. Um, and that's the yod Hey, vav hey. And if you got to remember, the root word for um, to be is Chava. And so we put the Yod on the front, the, the, the letter Yod on the front is like he was, he is, he is to be. So the words in Hebrew, it, it could be Yahweh, it could be Yahweh. There's no consensus on the V or the W sound. However, <laughs> like the Hebrew language wasn't dead in the respect that nobody spoke it. It was still used in liturgical practices and that Vav has always had a V sound. <laughs> and remember the Bible says, oh my gosh, Jennifer, are you on here? Um, she just sent me a message. Hi, Jennifer, I think you are here. There you go, shalom. Um, and, and, and the verse is, Ephraim is my helmet, Judah is my lawgiver. Remember, Jews aren't all wrong and Christians aren't all wrong. They both have some part of the truth. So the Christians understand Jesus, Yeshua is the helmet, right? The helmet of salvation. And the Jews understand the Torah. And the Jews have always kept their identity as God's people. And so um, they got to keep that identity. They were not the scattered ones who lost their identity. And so with this pronunciation of the name, in, in the pronunciation of Hebrew, they've always used that Vav sound there. Some people try to say the Paleo Hebrew had a U or a W sound. However, there's little evidence to support that. And the person who really started pushing it was a man from Washington who was not a Jew, did not have linguistic practice in Hebrew. And just I'm just going to say, I'm not saying he's wrong. I'm just saying his evidence is not strong and, and and I don't mean so please don't take this I hate to like even bring up my past but I was a college professor I taught actually other professors at my university at my college how to do I taught research writing and I'm very attuned to what to look for with research and data and and so when I spot loopholes and things that are missing I'm very careful with that, right? Because I mean, this is something I taught. And so anyway, when you look at the evidence from the first century manuscripts, they had in their writing, Yahweh. And you have to remember that people that were using the name Yahweh were Northern tribe of Israelites mixed in with Assyrians, and they were not influenced by the Masoret Judaism people. So the Masorets did want to hide the pronunciation of the sacred name. And they did not want people to utter it, so they would not. Anyway, when they started putting vowel points in, the Masoretes 
in the sixth century, then it became the word Yehovah. That's what they have in six. You, I mean, there's thousands of manuscripts. Nehemiah Gordon has this documented where they literally put that name in there. But then at the same point, they wouldn't say it. And they said, they would say that like, you could only pronounce the sacred name every seven years. And the Masoretes were like, literally, it was known that they took like the vowel points and put them backwards on. So that's where we get, look at this name, this, this pronunciation is like, really, we got to look at, that's why I pronounce it. And that's what I was, that's what I was bringing up. That the reason we, I pronounce it this way is I'm going off the first century manuscripts that were people who had not been tainted by Judaism. There's very little evidence that it was the Paleo Hebrew had a V or a U sound, or I mean a, a W or U sound. Just so that's where if you get confused, like what are these name things? I want you to feel comfortable saying whatever name. Um, in the New Testament, we see the word Zeus and we see the name Jesus. It's not the same root word and it is not the same word. I understand some people try to say it's wrong to say Jesus. Nope, I was saved by the name of Jesus. <laughs> I didn't know any other name. And in Hebrew, in um, Genesis, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter three, when Moses says, who shall I say sent me? He says, Eyech, Eyech asher Eyech. and that means I will be who I will be. It does not mean I am. In fact, that's the only place in all of the scriptures of the Tanakh where they translate that phrase as I am. And the reason, I mean, I have seen the physical documentation. The reason they said they translate it as I am is because they felt that people would be uncomfortable with a God not contained in a box. Like the, the, if he was, I will be who I will be, they didn't like that. But that's who God said he is. It's <laughs> like Yahweh literally said, I will be who I will be. And, and, and so I feel like, yeah, there's a word Zeus in the book of Acts and there's, or is it Acts? Anyway, it's in the New Testament and then there's the word Jesus. They're not the same root word. It's not the same word. I know what God told me. There was some dreams and stuff and it was always Yahweh in the dreams. So I'm going to go with that, but I don't judge anybody or condemn anybody, right? If you're going to say a different name and feel free, I feel you should feel free here to say Jesus. <laughs> like I feel you should feel free to say Yahusha if that's what you want to say. I feel you should feel, I just feel like <laughs> those are trivial matters and the Bible says not to argue about debatable matters. And those are debatable matters because yes, the first century writings have his name as Yahweh. Sixth century and later writings have his name as Yehovah. <laughs> it's never Yehuah. That just, Yehuah doesn't work grammatically. You can't have three open syllables in Hebrew. But the point being, those are divisions that we shouldn't really worry about. Okay, I think we have enough people on here. I did not check, um, honestly, I was kind of like not paying attention. So I don't know who's all on here. I, I lost track. I'm sorry, shalom, shalom. We are going to be going through the book of Romans. If you have not yet listened to my podcast on the book of Galatians, please go find it on God's Little Hummingbird or message me privately. I know to look in my spam folder now. Um, and I will send you the link because when I went, I go through this that podcast of Galatians and then you will see that it's never saying not to obey the law. And remember the live video we made on Saturday morning at 10.30 a.m. this last week. Please go watch it if you did not. And I say, is the New Testament for the Christians and the Old Testament for the Jews? And we prove no. It was for everyone always. And so, like, if you looked at Exodus chapter 12, um, Numbers chapter 15, I think it's Leviticus 15, Leviticus 19, um, Isaiah 56, it always says there's one law for the native born and the stranger and the Gentile. And so we go, went through that on that podcast. And in fact, I opened today to another verse. I was just reading. I'm always reading all day of the Bible. And I had opened to another place and I, it was somewhere in Leviticus. And I was like, oh, another one. Anyway, those things kind of set the premise for what we're talking about tonight. And please know, we do not, there's no judgment here. We do not hate people who are in the Babylonian system. We do not, I do not want any meanness or anger. I don't want any condemnation. I don't want you to feel like you're going to hell if you don't obey the law. Here's the thing. The Bible says, Jesus, Yeshua, my Messiah, your Messiah's words say in Matthew 5, um, I did not come to destroy, do not think that I came to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Um, therefore, he who breaks the least of the commandments will be least in the kingdom of heaven. And he who does and obeys them will be great in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, I think I skipped the whole part where it says not one jot or tittle of the law will have pass away until heaven and earth pass away. Yeah, let me rephrase that. Um, do not think that I came to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill. Um, not one jot or tittle of the law will by any means pass away until heaven and earth 
have passed away. So we know heaven, heaven and earth haven't passed away. At least didn't happen when I was sleeping. <laughs> like I didn't notice it. And uh, and then he says, he who breaks the least of the commandments will be least in the kingdom of heaven. Do you notice that it doesn't say you're in hell? <laughs> it doesn't say Sheol. It said least in the kingdom of heaven. And so I'm going to just put out there and, and, and position this that Christians, you obey 80% of the Torah. <laughs> like, you think you don't obey the law, but you do. <laughs> like, the law is written on your heart. That's exactly what the Holy Spirit did. And so you're more obedient than you think. In fact, the two things that most, well, there's three things that most Christians really struggle with. They were like, they, did, they want to eat that bacon and that pork. And the Sunday, which was Constantine, changed that to Sunday. And, and then they also really get scared about the sacrifices and they, they, that confuses them. And so I think we can go through that a little different time. Shalom, Tara, how are you? I was telling my husband just tonight what a nice lady you were, um, that, that it was so, you seemed so sweet. And um, so again, um, just remember there's no judgment and no condemnation here. We're just trying to help you set you free, okay? Um, and we're gonna go through the book of Romans trying to help explain that the law is forever. It's not just for the Jews. It's like, and again, go look at the podcast in, that I make on God's Little Hummingbird for Galatians. That's already been made. And then the live video from the other day and please reach out. So, okay, let me just, let's just begin. And we already prayed. So I do pray Father God sets it guard over us. I'm just gonna check. Did anybody yet ask a question just to make sure I'm not missing anything um and then okay perfect okay first of all <laughs> let's look at who this book is to paul a bond servant of yeshua hamashiach jesus christ called to be an apostle separated to the gospel of god which he promised before through his prophets in the holy scriptures concerning his son yeshua hamashiach our lord who was born of the seed of david according to the flesh and declared to be the son of god with power according to the spirit of holiness paul is the master of run-on sentences okay <laughs> by the resurrection from the dead through him through yeshua we have received grace and apostleship for obedience for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name among right all nations where was abraham's seed going to go oh right all nations we're going to be blessed in his seed zerah that is the word sperm not to get a little graphic there but it physically meant his posterity was going to go to every nation so if you're from ethiopia if you're from mongolia if you're from america guess what Somewhere in every single nation, the seed of Abraham is gone. In fact, I get off on a lot of tangents. In the book of John, Yeshua says to cast out their net one more time. They cast out their net and they bring in 153 fish. Do you know at the time of that event, there were 153 Greek or Gentile nations? And what Yeshua was telling them, my fish who are in the sea are going to be brought up. Now let's back up. In the book of Genesis, did you know that Jacob is the first one who told Joseph that Manasseh and Ephraim would multiply like the fishes? If you read the Hebrew, it says they were going to multiply like the fish. Now doesn't it make sense why God says in Jeremiah, I'm gonna make you fishers of men. And then when Jesus Yeshua was here with his disciples, he said, I'm going to make you fishers of men because they had already been likened to fish, which is interesting because fish live in water. And what are we told the water is? In scripture, we're told in the book of Ephesians and elsewhere, water is symbolic of the word of God. Does this not make like a beautiful story? So here's the Ephraimites prophesied to become the fish. They were going to multiply like the hadagim. Dagim is the word fish there. So if you want to look for it in your Hebrew, it does not tell you in the interlinear that it is the word fish. But I'm telling you the word dag in Hebrew, D-A-G. You know those aren't the Hebrew letters, right? But the transliteration is dog. That's a fish. <laughs> and they were going to multiply like the fish. And then we're always told to be fishers of men. Okay, so... I get off on tangents, I know, but it's fun. <laughs> okay, so we were called for obedience to the faith. Obedience, obedience, that's a key word. 
among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Yeshua HaMashiach, to all who are in Rome. Where is he writing? Rome. Beloved of God, called to be saints. In Hebrew, one of the definitions of the word saints is chasadim. Have you ever heard of the Hasidic Jews? They call themselves the saints. <laughs> chasadim is based on the root word for loving, kind, or merciful ones. Okay. Grace to... I have not prepped, by the way. I have not prepped. I literally was up at 3.30 this morning. If I miss something, like literally, like stop me or say something feel free to say something okay grace to you and peace from elohim our father and the lord jesus christ yeshua hamashiach i hope you all know elohim is god it's actually plural it's god's because you have a father and you have a son and um so if i say elohim or if i say yeshua hamashiach yeshua is jesus again we already talked about that name thing at the beginning um yeshua and then hamashiach is the messiah First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, who I am served with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, um, making request of it by some means. Now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. So he's a Jew, and they are Gentiles. We have a mutual faith, and he's calling them to obedience of the faith. Interesting. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. Because he's going to the Gentiles. These Rome... Rome is the Gentiles, okay? I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are, who are in Rome also. I am going to point out. It says that same word, this word gospel here, Basru. Yes, Winona, you definitely can join in, sweetie. I don't know what I just got a notification for, um, but I admit I'm still learning these. <laughs> okay, anyway. Okay, where was I at? The gospel. So Jesus, Yeshua, it says, taught the gospel. That's before he died and rose again. And he said to repent. It says John the Baptist was teaching the gospel. Um, guess what he was teaching? Repentance to return to the law of Moses, to return from our dead works, to turn from our bad works, and to return to God's ways. Remember. Okay, so here. So my husband believes that Jesus is God and there are no three gods. I brought up. Sorry, I read out loud. When I do this, there are no three gods. I was brought up believing the Trinity. He was brought up of apostolic. Okay, so, yes. Okay, Jesus and the Father are different. The word, we just kind of hit on that. The word God in Hebrew is actually gods. It's plural. So in the beginning, if you look at Genesis chapter 1, it says in the beginning. Um, well, I said... <laughs> Um, Elohim is the word there. I just spoke that in Hebrew, sorry. But that Elohim is plural. If it's singular, it's El. And then you'll notice that God says, let us make man in our image. Okay, there was two of them, the Father and the Son. And when Yeshua is on earth, we see him praying to the Father. You see him saying, I'm going to sit at the right hand of the Father. If Yeshua is the Father then how could you sit at your own right hand? And so what people misunderstand is that the name of Yahweh is, okay, so think about your son or your children. It's the last name. So my, we're Smith. <laughs> my husband's grandfather got kicked out of the family. So they became Smiths. <laughs> but he's a Smith and his son, my son, is a Smith, right? They're two different people. They bear the same name, but they should be unified one, the word one echad doesn't mean just like a one thing. It means like a husband and wife one. So like my husband and I, my husband and I are supposed to be one in Yahweh. One purpose, one vision, one faith, one goal, one everything, right? It doesn't mean we become one person. So it's two, but with a singular vision and hope. And that's what you will see in throughout scripture. If you read the whole Bible, when Yeshua returns, he is called Yahweh Sidkenu. Like he bears the name of the Father. Okay, so... Verse 16, so this is writing to Rome, saying it's for obedience. 
for I am not, Shalom Morgan, I'm glad you got some little free time on here, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Messiah. Remember, Yeshua was preaching the gospel, John the Baptist was preaching the gospel, the same gospel before the cross, after the cross, because so many people say, well, after Jesus died, then you didn't have to obey. No, it's the same gospel message. <laughs> the same gospel message is the Messiah is coming to pay for your sins. Okay, go and turn no more. Go and, go and sin no more. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first, and also for the Greek. I want to point out this word Greek. They will sometimes use the word uncircumcised. They will also sometimes use the word Gentile. Right? <laughs> so, Hi, Tara. Great explanation. Okay, perfect. Okay. Yes, and I put, I went through the name. I don't know if you caught it at the beginning, so you may have to go back and see that, but, and always reach out. But, okay, so this gospel message is for the Jew first. So I have a ton of people saying the New Testament is only for the Gentiles, but we proved that wrong on Saturday. It was all Jewish writers. They, did, they labeled two of the books to the 12 tribes of Israel. Like, right? We have one faith, one hope. We're not supposed to divide. God doesn't show preference like, you Gentiles get to go have a big party and just be licentious sluts. And you Jews, I'm going to punish you with this Torah. No, the Torah is beautiful. I was just reading. Oh my gosh. I literally jumped up and down. I was like reading the Bible tonight and I opened up to the Psalms and it was like, my heart is delightful in you. And I was like, oh, Father God, yes. And I was like, I noticed I was literally like, yeah, I love your law. Once you know, you know. Um, okay, so I'm sorry. For it is, okay, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. What does that mean? The just. Here is talking about justified. So if you are justified, then you live by faith. And what does your faith produce? Good works. Faith without works is dead. Okay. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. So that means there's still a law. If there's ungodliness and if there's unrighteousness, therefore, there is still a law that points against that. Hmm. So the law didn't go away. Because if there was no law, there's no sin imputed. If there's no law, there's nothing wrong. In America, we have more laws on the books than any nation in the world. And that's true. And guess what? We're called the land of the free. It's because we have so many laws. Laws protect your freedom. God's laws protect our freedom, right? Like, do not murder that person over there. They're telling you, don't murder me, don't murder me. Like, God's saying, like, let me live, right? Don't steal from me. That's protecting me. It also teaches us how to love God. So on all those things, hang everything, right? How to love God, how to love your neighbors, yourself. And then all of the 613 laws hang, go within those chapter headings, so to speak. Okay. Anyway, so the wrath of God is coming against unrighteousness, which is not rightness and ungodliness. Therefore, the law, the law points out the ungodliness and the righteousness. Without a law, there wouldn't be any of that. Who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what be known of God is manifest to them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. I'm trying to read a little slow, because I go really fast usually. So I'm not trying to read choppy, but I know I can talk fast. <laughs> Professing to be wise, oh, does this sound like everybody I taught at colleges with? <laughs> this is, right? Professing to be wise, they become fools. And changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature, creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. I mean, this is talking about those who turn to idolatry. Hi, please go over the faith without works again. Okay, just one second. Hi, ID, shalom. Um, God gives these people over who pretend to be wise and who, who deny there's a God, even though it's pretty inexcusable. If you have ever taken a biology class and you look at a cellular, the anatomy of a cell, <laughs> there is a great like mechanical construct going on there that you cannot deny. Like that is created. 
<laughs> like, like you would have to make a car and you have to build all the components. And that little cell, that little atom is so mechanically perfect and so precise, right? You can't deny that that was created. It had to have been made. And so that's what it's saying. Those people who deny that, they are, they are, they're wicked, they're wicked, they're foolish. And so for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. Listen, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men. This is talking about sodomy, homosexuality. Leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. Okay, so this is... God saying he gives them over to baseness, right? Okay, and I'm not ignoring you, Miss uh, Nelly Hun. I'll go back to the faith without works in just one second. Here, let me get to the end of the chapter. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. I pray all the time. He never gives me over to anything wrong. <laughs> I'm always like, smack me, spank me knock my head with a cast iron pan. I don't care what you got to do. Don't let me go the wrong way. <laughs> like, just help me, God. I don't want to be given over. So here's what he gave him over to. Being filled with all unrighteousness, right, unrighteousness against the Torah, sexual immorality against the Torah, wickedness against the Torah, covetousness against the Torah, maliciousness, all these things are against the Torah. Full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, <laughs> they are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving. Un Do you notice those are all against the law of God? And we're told that's bad. So therefore, the law of God is good because the law of God is the opposite of these bad things. Okay, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. So, here we're getting to something where these people understand these works are wrong, but yet they still approve them. Nellie Quick, let's go back. Faith without works is dead. When you, your faith, just like Abraham, if you believe there's a God, once you are saved already, you are saved when you acknowledge you are a sinner and that then you say, Father God, I want your salvation. Please save me. And that is his son, Yeshua, who paid that price. That's all you got to do. You don't have to be baptized. You don't have to speak in tongues. You don't have to get circumcised. You don't have to keep the law from, eh, to be saved. That was the salvation from eternal damnation. I pray all the time, Lord, help me not to sit at tables that you would have flipped. Yeah, so I, I'm i not sure what you're saying with that, Jacqueline, but <laughs> Jesus Jesus flipped, I, I'm not sure if that's what you mean, like when Jesus flipped, the, Yeshua flipped the money changers table, um, he was very upset that they were making his father's house a house of, a den of thieves. And so, yeah, but with, with, your, with your faith, Nellie, what we are told then, that then Abraham then went and 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 performed the obedience he obeyed the law of god once he was saved he was saved and then he got circumcised and and jacqueline yeah that's just not true i mean yes he's the temple but of course if you read ezekiel um ezekiel 40 to the end that that temple ezekiel is a proven prophet of god and Ezekiel's temple has never, ever been built. And we know that the third temple or temple will be built because Ezekiel has been proven a prophet. We are specifically told in Ezekiel 38 and 39, that's the final battle, the battle of Gog and Magog. And that in 40, we are in 43, in fact, we are told that describe the temple <laughs> so that we are ashamed, right? And it wasn't just to the Jews. It says to the house of Israel as well. And of course, the house of Israel, the 10 northern tribes were scattered all through Europe. Okay, so um, 43 says once we need to be ashamed that we lost that because remember we didn't lose the temple until 70 AD. So they were still doing sacrifices. Even the book of Hebrews shows that. The book of Hebrew says that, um, right, and I get that, but I'm trying to explain to you, Jacqueline, when this third temple has never been built. The third temple is a millennial thing. So there's going to be a peace agreement soon where this temple will be built. 
And it literally tells us that the Antichrist will defile this temple. He's going to set up an abomination of desolation, much like Antiochus Epiphany did. But Yeshua said it's coming in the future. Antiochus Epiphany was much longer before Yeshua, Jesus. And so, and so we know this third temple is coming. In fact, if you read Ezekiel chapter 45, what it very specifically says is when Jesus Yeshua returns, we he says he cleanses the temple on Abib first, which is the first year, day of the year of the biblical calendar. He cleanses that temple and then he leads us in offerings because, hear me out, the offerings and sacrifices never saved us because people are always like, because the church teaches that they all went away. Well, they forget that they went away because we were disobedient and God said he took the temple because of our sin, not because it was a good thing to lose it. Um, and Jesus warned us that that was going to happen. So we're going to have to worship in spirit and truth, but it's still coming back. He wants to restore it to us. And the offering, just like we keep Passover every year and just like, bear with me, I do not agree with Christmas, but people do Christmas every year. So by the Christian's logic, they kind of say, well, we don't need to do sacrifices anymore. Then why would you need to do Christmas anymore? Jesus didn't need to be born again. Believe me, he was not born at Christmas, but it's a point I'm trying to make. They argue with us that, um, that we shouldn't do Passover anymore. Why? That's actually a commanded holiday. Like Jesus died for us. We should remember his death. He doesn't need to die again. It was good enough what he did, but it doesn't mean I don't remember it. Was like his birth not good enough for you? Is that why you get what I'm saying? I don't think it's okay. Please do not think it's okay to do Christmas. I'm making a point. People continue to do different holidays every year to remember things. And that's in the Hebrew, the word zakar. We're supposed to remember, right? And so the Passover was to remember that Jesus died. Feast of first fruits was to remember that he rose from the dead, right? We still do it because we remember what he did. It's a great, wonderful thing to remember. And so with the offerings, when they're reinstated, please go check me out. Ezekiel chapter 45. I mean, everybody, everybody. I used to talk to David Wilkerson from New York Times Square Church. Everybody, including him, said, yes, that's the millennial kingdom temple. Yes, that is Jesus. That's the David in that temple. It's not symbolic. It's not metaphorical. It is very physical. Why would we do it again? Why would we do those offerings again? Well, six out of the eight offerings are just dinner with daddy. It's a barbecue. And everybody likes a barbecue. And it smells fantastic. And that's why it's a pleasing aroma to God. And honestly, you took the best of your animals. You took it to the temple. And you ate it. You gave part of it to the priest. And you ate in the presence of God. It literally was dinner with daddy. It was a thanksgiving. Or an offering of like, here's your tithe, whatever. The burnt offerings of sin offering, well, it says right there in Ezekiel 45, please check me out. Do not just argue and then also don't just take my word for it go read it yourself um and they will institute the past the sacrifices again as a remembrance of what jesus did it will never it never did justify us or cleanse us the blood of animals can't do it it was to teach us what our messiah was going to do okay so once you have the faith now I kind of back to that thing once we have obedience i guess i got off on another thing because i was talking to jacqueline um, about the temple, but please go check that out. Please go check it out. Ezekiel. Um, but okay, Nelly, I hope I answered your question. Faith without works is dead. So I can say I have believe in Jesus and I might still go to heaven, right? The Matthew five says he who breaks the least of the commandments will be least in the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't say you're going to go to hell and the least of the commandments I would say is like pork. However, please make a note guys, Isaiah 65 verse five. In Isaiah 66, verse 17, I think it's, the verses might be switched, but I think that's how they go. It says those eating swine's flesh, when Jesus returns the second time, not the first coming, that is, it's talking about the day of the Lord, it's talking about the renewed, the, the new heavens and the new earth. It says those eating swine's flesh will be destroyed. I'd rather not be destroyed. So let's just keep reading. <laughs> Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are, I'm sorry, whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. This is talking about the non-believers judging the believers, okay? For you who judge practice the same things, but we know, believers, know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. Wait a minute. If there's a judgment of God, against the unrighteous things there again there is still a law in place that points out the bad the law did not save us the law points out the unrighteous acts of humans correct we just read all of these in verse 28 to the end all of these things are violations of the torah right 
<laughs> the Torah pointed out that that was wrong. Okay, so, and do you not, do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Right? And that's a big one. We think, <laughs> there's a Bible verse that God says, you think I'm altogether like you. Um, yeah. I've been sitting here silent, letting your sin build up. So now prepare to meet your maker. <laughs> and I don't want that verse. I want to be like trembling and humbly walking before him always so that if I am in error, he immediately like disciplines me and I am receiving correction. This is saying when he does, he's not judging right away. So you just think you're fine. That judge, he's being merciful to you to give you time to repent because <laughs> God is very merciful very patient. He doesn't want to destroy you. He says in Ezekiel, I don't want, I don't want anybody. I don't want to destroy anybody. Just wicked, the person who's doing wickedness, please turn from your unrighteousness and I'll forgive you. That's in Ezekiel. <laughs> He's like, please just turn. Okay. Verse five, but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation in the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. Hmm. There's a common saying that is not biblical that says, oh, God knows your heart. Every single thing in scripture, if you're going to go look through the book of Revelation, read the whole thing. I'm going to judge your works. I'm going to judge your works. He says, I'm going to judge your works. Read just the first three chapters of Revelation. He doesn't say I judge your heart. <laughs> he says, I judge your works, what you do. Because if you have a pure heart, you're going to do the right works. Okay, so who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those, listen, to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. That means they continue to do what is right. Therefore, there must be a wrong. <laughs> if there is no law, there's no sin and there's no wrong. But because there is a law, it helps us to identify what is right and what is wrong. And right here, if we continue in patient continuance to do what is right, that means I watch my tongue. I don't lose my temper. I don't murder. I don't commit adultery. Hmm, the laws of God. I continue in patient continuance to do what is right. We just read back here what were the bad things? Sexual morality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, blah, 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 blah. Things against the Torah. Okay, I'm making a point here because some people miss the connections. Okay. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth. Ooh, ooh, if you don't obey, you better be careful. But obey unrighteousness. Ooh, are you a slave of sin? Sin is transgression of the law. Uh-oh. We might have a problem. What do you what do you expect? Indignation and wrath tribulation and anguish on every, the tribulation just means trouble. It's not talking about the great tribulation. On every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek, right? Because it comes to the house of God first. Okay, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also the Greek. Oh, so the Jews aren't cast off either. Guys, there's one faith, one hope, one Messiah. There's neither Jew nor Greek with God. For them... <laughs> Paul's next words I should have read. For there is no partiality with God. There, right? Exodus 12. There's one law for the native born and the, the Gentile. Numbers 15. Numbers 5. Leviticus 19 says the same thing. There's one law for the Gentile and the Israelite. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I said that right. <laughs> My brain. Like I said, I've been up since 3.30. Bear with me. Guys, there's no partiality with God. God didn't say, you Jews have to obey this law. This is going to be hard for you. And you Christians, you just go have a big old party. No, there's no partiality with God. He has the same set of standards. Caleb was a keen as I. Caleb was not a Jew. Caleb became the leader of Judah, but he was grafted in. He was a blood Gentile. Isn't that amazing? Caleb was a blood Gentile. God doesn't care if you're a Gentile. God doesn't care if you're a Jew. He wants your heart. Oh, hi, Gina. <laughs> Sorry. But remember, it'll be posted on the, in the timeline. You can go back and watch it. Um, so you should be able to watch it. Okay, there's no partiality with God. God didn't say this law is only for you people. We established that 10.30 a.m. last Saturday. Please go read it. I said, is the New Testament for the Gentiles? 
and the Old Testament for the Jews. And we say, nope. Yeah. All of the writers of the New Testament are Jewish. They write two of the books very specifically to the Jews. They say to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. And then God doesn't care if you're a Gentile either. He loves you. Ruth was a Gentile. <laughs> Caleb was a Gentile. They got grafted in. So, okay, anyway. For as many, listen, for as many have sinned without law will also perish without law. This is, let's go through this because this can be confusing. As many have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Ooh, hot diggity dog. Did we just get a verse that people don't like? Did you hear what I just read? So this is not saying that if you don't have the law, if you weren't given the law, you don't have to obey the law. Because in Galatians, we already established this. When the Gentiles are over here, I do this little weird picture, I know, but I was a teacher, I was an elementary school teacher. I had to do very graphic things with first graders. You have over here, you were Gentile. And it says, when you did not know God, you worshiped those things which were not God. But now you know God, you're over here, you crossed over. Now you know God, don't return to the things not of God. <laughs> they didn't have the Torah over here. They didn't have obedience to God's way over here. <laughs> they couldn't have returned to it. That wasn't because they didn't have it. That's not what he's talking about. He's not saying don't return to worshiping God's ways. He's saying don't return to doing pagan ways, okay? And right here, he's saying, look, if you didn't have the law and you died without the law, you're, you're gonna die without the law. Like, you just didn't know. And if you have, okay, I'm sorry. For as many have sinned without the law, they'll perish without the law. So they're gonna perish if they don't have the law. <laughs> this wasn't a good thing. It didn't say they're gonna thrive without the law. It doesn't say they're blessed without the law. And then as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. So, but we already know all humans will be judged by the law. That's like in the book of Hebrews as well. But what it's saying is if you know the law, you're going to be judged by it. And the Bible does say, gosh, do you guys remember? Is it in Isaiah? It said, oh, is it Jeremiah? He, somebody help me out. Maybe it's Isaiah, maybe it's Jeremiah. It says, he who sins on purpose receives more stripes than him who sins accidentally, but they both get stripes. <laughs> it, says, when it says he gets fewer stripes. It doesn't say no stripes. So that's what it's saying is you're going to perish. If you don't have the law, you're going to perish. So you have no hope. But then if you do have the law and if you're breaking the laws and being like what we were talking about here in Romans chapter one, then you're going to get that spanking. Okay. You're going to be destroyed. Again, let me read verse 13 though. This is a cr just a huge crux, um, important thing. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God. Everybody hears the law. But the doers of the law will be justified. That does not mean you're saved by it. What it means is that when you were in, you accepted the Passover lamb, if you truly believe in that Passover lamb, you're going to be born again. And the born again means you become a new person, which means now you're obedient to God, not disobedient to God. And obedience to God is obeying the Torah. You are justified. <laughs> Your faith is justified by those works, okay? For when Gentiles who do not have the law this is talking about the people who didn't know the law. By nature, do the things in the law. These, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts. This is a good thing. <laughs> it's not bad. I just said at the beginning of this video, most Christians obey like 80% of the law. Like you obey. You have three things you argue with. Pig, Sunday, and sacrifices. And you cannot do sacrifices in your backyard. We will not do those again until we have the third temple. Okay, please feel free to keep asking questions. And Gina, yeah, conversely, works without faith is also dead. Exactly, Gina. Right, I can be a Judaistic person. Judaism is not the Torah. Judaism is the Talmud. Remember, that's a thousand extra rules. I can make a checklist and say, I didn't commit adultery. Now, that is from the Torah. I didn't commit adultery, I'm fine. And Yeshua's like, um, I saw you looking at that person over there lustfully. That's not fine. That's your heart. And so if I make a checklist and I want to just live by the letter of the law, black and white, that's not how the spirit works. So when you start to be frustrated at somebody, the spirit will go smack you. <laughs> like, what are you thinking? You don't have the right to be frustrated at the person. What have you been forgiven of? That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit takes the law on your heart. Remember that the new covenant is the with the house of Judah and the house of Israel. Notice it doesn't say Gentiles, but you're grafted in. 
you're grafted in. Um, but it doesn't say Gentiles. Please read Hebrews 8, Hebrews 10, and go back to Jeremiah 31 from what it's quoting. And what it says is that law is now on your heart and mind. So it's like you grew up. Not only now are you reading the textbook, you better go out for me. Okay, I was a licensed teacher. So in the classroom, it was a lot different than learning how to be a teacher, right? When I had my own classroom, <laughs> you learn it. Then it better be written on my heart and mind. I better know what the textbook said. That's what it was talking about. So when I had the Torah before the Holy Spirit was writing it on my heart and mind, I would have to read it. And I was like, well, it just says right here, I mean, not to commit murder. So I'm fine if I'm angry at my brother. And you should, yeah, the Holy Spirit's like, no, 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 no. So then we get that understanding. Like, oh, right. I can't even be angry at my brother because that is not merciful and that is wicked and that's judgmental, okay? So that's what having that Holy Spirit written on our hearts and minds is doing for us. It's, it's telling us how to enact the Torah to the very spirit of the law, not just by the letter. We understand from the very acts of mercy, grace, humility, how to truly do the Torah because it's not just a checklist. Gina, that was a good point. Okay, so not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Okay, we just read that. I'm sorry. So then we said the Gentiles, when they do the things in the law, like on accident, it shows that the law of God was written on their hearts. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. I will say the word Jesus Christ here, so those of you reading along, do not get confused. I typically say Yeshua. Jesus is not the same root word as Zeus. They are two different words. Please look even in the Greek concordance just to make sure that I'm not lying. There's a word for Zeus. There's a word for Jesus. They're not the same root word in Greek. I'm not saying his name was Jesus. It wasn't. But I am saying, please don't judge somebody who's saying that. I don't want to put a stumbling block before my brother who are just coming and turning. And many of us learned about the Messiah in that name. So I feel we should not put a stumbling block there. Um, and when God himself says, I will be who I will be, he doesn't say I am who I am. He says in Genesis 3, Genesis 3, that a yeah, asher, yeah, I will be who I will be. The, it's never translated as I am other than that one instance. Okay, and we talked about that at the beginning of the real with the translators, why they said they did that. Okay, indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law. Who is this talking to? So wait a minute, we're, we're talking about people in Rome, but these are some Jews in Rome. Indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law. Okay, let's pretend, okay, me, I am a Jew. Let's pretend all I say was, well, I've got the law. I obey the law, but I don't believe in Jesus as the Messiah. And I just made this checklist, right? And I, you, and make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor to the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. Okay, right? Because he's like, you understand, like you, you think you understand this. You have this law, which is good, and you think you have this wisdom. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? Listen to what the issue is. He's not going to tell them not to obey the law. What he's going to say is what? Um, okay, so, so they added in the name Jesus. Well, there's no. Okay, here, let me get to this. So you, therefore, who teach another, do, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? Do you see what he's talking about is the hypocrisy. <laughs> I've almost never met a Christian pastor or a Jewish rabbi who's not a hypocrite. Just got to say, my husband, when we, um, yeah, when we were first turning our life back to God back in 2000, my husband was made treasurer of a church <laughs> because my husband had come back from being an atheist. Okay, let me tell you something. My husband was a pastor. And by being a Christian pastor, he became an atheist because he said the Christians don't do anything in the Bible. So he thought it was made up and he was out of there. <laughs> I'm not even joking because he was like in that church for like three years. He was a pastor, grew the church from like 30 people to like 800 and then over a thousand immediately. And then he's like, he's, he's like, I knew Christmas wasn't when Jesus was born. He goes and it says right here, he who loves and practices a lie and doesn't enter the kingdom of heaven. And he goes, I knew Sunday wasn't the Sabbath. It was Saturday. He goes, then I realized, he goes, I thought the whole religion crap was made up because they weren't even doing anything the Bible said. He goes, so anyway, for real life, he became an atheist. And then I met him. Then he turned his life back to God in 2000. And then, um, and then <laughs> he was doing the books for this church. We were youth ministers. Of, well, he was a treasurer and then we were youth pastors which I don't, I'm sorry, we, we were wrong. We shouldn't have been in that system, but he uncovered all sorts of fraud. <laughs> like, and that's what I see in every church. Like, this is what it's saying. Like, 
So you teach people not to steal, but you're stealing yourself. Like you don't, you say not to commit adultery, you're committing adultery. <laughs> like Ted Haggard, right? These people, yes, pray for their souls, right? We want them to repent. But you who hate idols, you who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law. They boast in the law. Do you dishonor God through breaking the law? Right? For none, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you as it is written. Why is that? Because they rejected Yeshua, the salvation grace. And when you just live by the letter of the law and you make your boasts in the law, but you're a hypocrite, you are judging it and you are blaspheming God's name. That doesn't work. So we can't boast in anything other than Messiah right? That's our boast. It's, it's him. It's his grace. It's his mercy. Um, let me go quickly to Kelly's question. So they added in the name of Jesus or what exactly are wears? Okay. So the, there is some speculation that the New Testament was also written in Aramaic or Hebrew. There's 28 Hebrew manuscripts that they have found all after the Greek manuscripts. So it does, they're not sure, but there is in the Talmud and Josephus, I'm sorry, in Josephus's writings, there seems to be an indication that some of the New Testament writings that were written in Hebrew were burned because it had the name Yeshua with the name Yahweh, the Father. And since the Judaism Jews did not accept Yeshua as the Messiah, they burned those scrolls. There is talk about that. Josephus seems to mention it. Okay, now... Jesus is the rendition of like, if I go, uh, my sister, for example, her name is um, Rebecca. Um, in other con countries, her name is different things like Rivka in Hebrew, Rebecca in English. I say that one because it's so obvious. They just pronounce it a little different. In Greek, <laughs> uh, yeah, how do we pronounce that? Aesius, it's like an Aesius. I don't really speak Greek, I read Greek. And so it's like Aesius and the word Zeus is different. So there's that's how I'm saying so many people try to say you can't say the name Jesus, but that's just wrong. I mean, it's like, it's just wrong. I studied linguistics all through college and you have to like look at the morphology of language and the etymology of the words. And there was the word Zeus in Greek. And then there was the word Aesius, Jesus. It wasn't the same root word or anything. So I just, that's where I'm saying, I don't think it's wrong for people to say Jesus. I do think it's beautiful to say his name, Yeshua. Here's the other thing though. I mean, some people say Yahusha. I don't want to judge them. I don't want to condemn them. I feel like, you know, and there's, there's, anyway, we've talked about that a lot today and, and I had it earlier in the video. So I'll let you go back to that. Now, 25, listen, for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you're a breaker of the law, your circumcision can be, has become uncircumcision, right? If you obey the part of the circumcision law, which girls, we can't do that. Thank God. I, <laughs> that would hurt. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> um, I don't mean that bad. I'm sorry. I don't mean to knock any of God's laws. They're all good. Okay, so for, circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. Right? It is profitable if you're keeping the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, notice this isn't saying he doesn't obey the law. But if a Gentile doesn't keep, I'm sorry, if a Gentile who's not circumcised is keeping the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? If you look at what we're talking about here, we are talking about, well, okay, there's two things here. There's the Jew who is called the circumcised and the Gentile who's called, and the, well, they use the word Greek here, is the uncircumcised. But what it's saying is they are boasting in the law. So we have to look at the whole premise here. They are boasting in the law. So if they got circumcised and are boasting in the law, as long as they kept it all, that'd be fine. But there's going to come a need for a savior, right? And so here, all of a sudden, here's this uncircumcised Gentile who's keeping the righteous, he's keeping the righteous requirement. He's like literally obeying the law, which means eventually he's going to get circumcised, right? But he's keeping the law. But the parts that he, and it's a process, right? So if his heart, and it doesn't, like, do people even understand what they're reading? It doesn't say he's not keeping the law. Like I hope, does that make sense? Like, yeah, right? He's keeping, this uncircumcised man is keeping the righteous requirements of the law. And his, so then his uncircumcised, his uncircumcision, his, his 
Gentile nature, the like the foreskin, it could be physical or spiritual here. Will, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And I feel this is more talking about in trying to insinuate, like, look, he is an Israelite. He is the Jew. Well, and I don't like to say just Jew because Jew is just a southern kingdom, but I think you understand. It's saying if the uncircumcised keeps the righteous requirements, these requirements of the law are righteous. <laughs> like, I just try to hammer these points home and slowly, so you see what I'm saying. It is not saying they weren't obeying it. It's a good thing. If that man's doing the righteous requirements of the law, his Gentile nature is gone away. He becomes an Israelite, right? Just like Caleb, just like Ruth. Caleb was a Kenazite. He became the leader. One of the two spies to go into the land of Israel was a Gentile. <laughs> People missed this. He was a Kenazite. God shows no personal favoritism. It's you loving him, coming into covenant with him. Okay. And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, there's the word fulfills again. That means obeys it. Doesn't mean end it, right? In Hebrew, that is a phrase that literally means to obey it. If you say you're fulfilling it, it means you're filling it up. You're doing it. You're obeying it. You're walking it out. So will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills or obeys the law, please understand this. Don't quote again. I mean, Jesus saying he fulfilled the law, meaning it going away. Look at this verse. It doesn't mean it went away. Judge. Okay, I'm sorry. I better read that all together. Will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who, even with your written code and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? What was he just hitting on here? The hypocrisy. He says, you teach people not to steal, but you steal. You teach people not to commit adultery, but you're committing adultery. Because, like Gina pointed out, when you have a checklist and you're just doing requirements without faith, there's no born again nature. And when you think you have faith and there's no works, that's not a born again nature either. You can't have faith without works and you cannot have works without faith. <laughs> you just can't. I mean, you can, but then that's not what God wants. I mean, if you want to be a believer... Okay, so these people in Rome to whom he was writing that were Jews at the time rested and boasted and like, well, we're circumcised. We're circumcised. We keep the law. We're fine. But he's like, but you're not actually keeping the law. <laughs> like you're literally being a hypocrite. And you're, right? He's like, you're being a hypocrite. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision. This is talking about the little cotton thing there. Nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Now, does that negate the law? Does this negate the law? Does this mean, well, it's just all spiritual now? No, we're going to prove that. Let's keep reading. What advantage then has the Jew or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God, the commandments of God. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, now we just established in chapters two and one that the righteous requirements of the law were the, the requirements of the law were righteous. That if a Gentile obeys them, that was a good thing. They got like basically accidental blessings because <laughs> it showed the the law written on their heart. He talks so good, so well of the law in chapters one and two. Shalom, Joshua. We are reading in Romans today. Um, so, right, we've already established this. And so here he's trying to tell us, listen, you can make a checklist. You can do everything what you think is right, but you're a hypocrite. Okay, you're a hypocrite. If you don't, be born again. You must have faith with works and works with faith. Okay, okay but if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. Certainly not. For then how will God judge the world? And we already established back in chapter 1, the things that God is going to judge are all violations of the Torah. The law pointed out our wrongdoing, and that's what God will judge. The law didn't. It's not our salvation. Our salvation is Yeshua who covers us with the blood when we 
did the bad things against the law, right? That's the salvation. Obedience to the law is our right, is our as our faith of our acts of works. May the Lord bless you. Oh, thank you. Um, Shalom, Jason. Um, let's see, Erica. I'm sorry. Let me just quickly pause and see because I don't want to miss comments. I'm praising God now for your softened heart and open eyes. Yes, yes, Kelly. That's amazing. Um, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, now let's keep reading here. Um, for if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? Oh, wait a minute. You can't be a sinner without the law. Remember, we established all these in the first three chapters, first two chapters. That law showed us we were sinners. The law did not save us, right? Do you get this? I think you do. Okay, so if I'm, okay, I'm still judged as a sinner. I'm judged. Hebrews tells us we're going to be judged by the law of Moses. And why not say, let us do evil that good may come as we are slanderously reported and as some affirm that we say their condemnation is just. And this is what the church does. The church says that Paul says we no longer have to obey the law. Paul says their condemnation is just. <laughs> right? Exactly. Matthew 5, 17. Yeah, we talked about that, Jason. That's awesome. Um, exactly. I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Um, therefore, you know, and not one jot or tittle of the law passed away until heaven and earth is passed away. Therefore, he who breaks the least of the commandments is least in the kingdom of heaven. And we did talk about at the beginning. And if you do and, and you obey them, you're great in the kingdom of heaven. Um, that Matthew 5 is so good. So good. But here's what it's saying. Paul, these words should hit every Christian right here because they are, these Christians are slandering Paul and saying, he's saying we don't have to obey the law anymore. And Paul's like, um, their, their condemnation is just because we don't just say to sin. We're not saying you can sin now. That's not what we're saying. That's what Paul's explaining. Okay. Verse nine, what then are we better than they? No, not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks, or Gentiles. Remember, Greek is this, the, the, overriding, the overriding word for Gentiles, that they are all under sin. All are under sin. Oh, wait a minute. So again, did we establish just here another verse where the law was never just for the Jews? Because if the Gentiles had no law, they would have no sin, Right? And remember in Galatians, they were told to leave when they didn't know God. They were doing things not of God. And they were supposed to come over here and do things of God and not to return to the things not of God. They were supposed to come to the Torah. They didn't have the Torah over here. They had no laws of God over here. This is without God. So they were supposed to come over with God and join to his covenants. They're not supposed to go back to without God. They couldn't return to the Torah. They didn't have the Torah. That's not what Galatians was speaking about not returning to, right? They're supposed to come to God's ways. And they couldn't return to God's ways because they hadn't been there. Does that make sense? I hope so. Okay, so all of us are sinners is what it's saying, which means just like Exodus 12 says, Exodus 12, 49, Numbers 5, Numbers 15, Leviticus 19, um, Isaiah 56, there's one law for the Gentile and the native born. Ezekiel 47, the last three verses. Um, Perfect. That's wonderful, Jason. Um, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin, as it is written. There is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. Their tongues they have practiced to, with their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. Guys, what does under the law mean in Hebrew? Ding, ding, ding. It means you're being judged by it like you're under arrest. And the law is only telling you what you're doing wrong if you're breaking it. Because if you're walking in the Holy Spirit, then you're not under the law. Like if you're walking in the Spirit, you're obeying the law. So you're not under arrest for penalty of the breaking the law. In Hebrew, in the Torah, it says eye for eye, hand for hand, foot for foot. But it doesn't say that. It says eye under eye, hand under hand, foot under foot. The reason it uses the word under there, takat, is because... That's the Hebrew understanding of when you break the law, you're under the law. And here, listen to this. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, you only need to be told to stop adulterating if you're committing adultery. You only need to be told to stop stealing 
if you're stealing. If you're listening to the Holy Spirit, you're not under that. You're not under arrest. The cop didn't have to pull you over. The little Torah cop, right? Okay. That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Right? I mean, that right there. Ooh, we need bells, whistles, the shofar. I was blowing the shofar earlier. <laughs> I don't know. I'm weird. I like to do that. Anyway, I need to blow the shofar right there because, guys, you know you're not saved by the law. That's what he's saying, but the law gives you the knowledge of sin. So if I tell, as a, let's pretend I'm just a Christian here, and I tell somebody, hey, Jesus loves you, repent and be saved, what do we repent from? Oh, we tell them to repent from sin. Okay, well, how do I know what sin is? <laughs> oh, there's an instruction manual that God gave us that helps us. And it says in Exodus 12, numbers, do I have to repeat it again? <laughs> I'll say it a billion times so you just remember it. Right? That law tells you what's right and wrong. And so when I tell a sinner to repent, if, I, if, I, if somebody believes in Jesus, okay, the way I want to word this is if, if, if I have somebody who's turning their life over to God, I don't just say, you're saved now. You believe in Jesus. There you go. Go, go on your way. <laughs> right? What do we say? Good, Kelly. We'll make good pairs. Um, what we'll say is, hey, you are now saved from eternal damnation because you have committed to Messiah Yeshua. Go and sin no more. Right? That's what this is. Romans is saying. The law points out what sin is. So here's your instruction manual. Please don't skip the instruction manual. <laughs> but it'll tell you the things that displease God and the things that please God. It does not save you. It is your instruction manual. Now how to be born again. How to live a born again holy life. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. Right. So we have the law. But what is the righteousness apart from the law? Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. That means the law and the prophets testify of this thing. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Yeshua HaMashiach to all and on all who believe. Do you hear that? Paul's wording. I sometimes, I've asked the Father why he let Paul write sometimes. I'm like, I don't mean that mean, but I'm like, he's, he confuses people. Even Second Peter says it. Like, I'm like, Lord, Paul was such an amazing person. And I see, he says, to obey the law. But so many people twist his words. I'm like, maybe Peter would have been a better writer. I don't know. I just, it's a joke that I have with God, not in a sacrilegious way, but you get what I'm saying. Let's read that again. Try to make sense of it. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Yeshua HaMashiach. So the law and the prophets point to this faith in Yeshua. It's apart from the law, but the law and the prophets point to it. So it's saying this law did not save you. The righteousness that saved you that the law and the prophets point to is Yeshua. I hope I got that. Okay. To all and all now who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short. All. That means there was a law for the Gentiles as well. The same law is for the Gentiles and the Jews because there's sin. <laughs> All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Messiah Yeshua, whom Elohim set forth as a propitiation, a payment by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, that's his patience, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. There were sins. There was a law pointing out the sins and God in his grace in his mercy, by his son, apart from the law, but what the law points to, provided his son to forgive us that. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, exactly, exactly, Gina. Okay. Does that make sense, guys? To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Yeshua. I think you all get that. That's pretty self-explanatory. Okay. Now, where is boasting then? Now it's heading back to what we were talking about at the beginning of chapter three, right? Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. So you're only boasting now. Your salvation does not come through you thinking that you obeyed the law good enough. You can't just say, well, we obey. 
Because Paul pointed out all their hypocrisy, that all have fallen short. You cannot rest in that. You must have a Savior, a Messiah who covered your lawless deeds. There's nothing you can boast in. You did not do anything well enough. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. <coughs> Let me get a drink. It's been a lot of talking. <laughs> and I was on the phone <clears throat> all day helping people. And I just need a little drink of water there. <coughs> okay, so they're away from four. the man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Listen to the next verse. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Right? Because their boasting was, hey, we're Jews. We have the law. We're saved. Paul's like, nope. I just saw you steal. He was like, you teach him not to steal, you're stealing. You're being a hypocrite. Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes. Of the Gentiles also, since there is one guide, God, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. And of course, often the Jews are called the circumcised, the Gentiles or the Greeks, the uncircumcised. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish it. Whoa, guys. Paul is saying we obey the law. By our faith in Messiah, we establish the law. Do you get that? Our faith in Messiah produces obedience. Please go back and watch the video if you missed the first couple chapters. It doesn't say that your faith in Messiah leads to lawlessness like the Antichrist. It says your faith in Messiah leads you to obedience. Remember, we read that already. Guys, this is beautiful. It would be nice if the Christian churches would teach this very important point. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. I would like that too. Chapter 4. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found it? has found according to the flesh. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, right? If he got circumcised and says, now that made me the heir of all Israel because he got circumcised, yeah, he could boast about that. But not before God, for what does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt, okay? So if when Abraham, if he, when he got circumcised, that was, that was a work. But his faith, I'm sorry, his belief was the faith that God counted as righteous. No, his works followed. He had to have the, the belief first. But to him who does not work, but, okay, but to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the godly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Remember, the whole issue is these Jews are saying that because they obey the law, they're fine. But Paul's like, you know, Here's who's fine. If the person isn't doing all, like, they're not working their way into righteousness. Okay, just, okay. But to him, I'm sorry, let me get this. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, your faith is believing that he is justifying you. He's saving you simply by that belief, right? His faith is accounted for righteousness. So if you believe that Jesus Yeshua is going to cover your sin, which is transgression of the law, that faith is what God wanted. He wants that heart. And that's what the Jews were missing in the first couple chapters that he addressed there. Those Jews did not have the faith they were sinners. They did not say like, hey, I am a sinner. Your Jesus, Yeshua, your blood covered me. They were saying the law, because they were obeying the law, made them justified. Does that make sense? I'm trying to, because Paul is confusing, it says in 2 Peter. But what we see is Paul is really just saying, your works did not save you. You can be a Jew, you can keep the law, and you could just slide right into hell. <laughs> like I always say, the pathway to hell is paved with good intention, right? So you can keep all the laws, but if you did not have the faith that you were a sinner, if you cannot understand that you were a hypocrite, if you cannot see where you're breaking the law. Remember, Paul says, you teach not to steal, but you're stealing. You're teaching not to do this stuff, but you're doing it. That doesn't count. You have to have the mindset that understands the belief and the faith that your only justification does not come from your works, but from the work that Yeshua did. However, what does he say? 
that makes you then obey the law. By, by faith in Messiah, we uphold the law. We start doing the law after we have the faith. That is the whole issue here. So don't read any book of the Bible and just take a verse without reading the whole context, okay? That's why it is so important. Okay, so just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds, lawless against the law, are forgiven. There's a law that stands in. If we have lawless and that's what needed to be forgiven, we definitely don't want to continue being lawless, do we? That was the bad place. And that we've been forgiven of when we believe, hello, sweet son. That's my baby. He just got on. So, right? Do you get that? <laughs> okay. I think you do. The lawless deeds are the ones that are forgiven. That's what we don't want to continue in. We want it to be now lawful. But we were forgiven before we obeyed the law right? Okay. And whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man who, to whom Yahweh shall not impute sin. Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only, so the Jew only, or upon the circum uncircumcised also, the Gentile? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised? Mm -mm. Or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of... Oh, wait a minute. What? what? And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had done while still uncircumcised. Do you get what this is saying? Just like over here, it says, do we make void the law through faith? No, you must have that faith. Abraham had the faith and then he got circumcised. It doesn't say his faith led him to never obey the law. So I hope this is really making sense. When you break it down like this, it is very obvious, Paul says, to obey the law. But what he is saying is, the law didn't save you. You must have faith and understand why you're obeying the law. Abraham had faith, and that faith prompted him to then get circumcised because he loved God. Right? Okay. Okay, so, and he was, okay, think of it this way. This might be a bad I hope I'm not making like a, a bad case here, but think about somebody who was forced to marry you. Like if you're forced into a marriage, then you just, right, you're just doing it, not because you love the person. But when you love somebody, you want to please them, right? Right? There's just all that. So when you fall in love with God, like you want to please him because God is really, really good. So while he was circumcised or uncircumcised, not well, okay, where am I at? Verse 11, and he received the sign of the circumcision, a seal. So your obedience to the Torah is then a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised. So while I was a sinner, doing really bad things, I was just gonna list some, I don't wanna list some. I was a very bad girl. Black leather goth, smoked like, smoked like a trucker, cussed like a trucker, Bleach bomb, bimbo hair. Praise God, praise God for saving me. <laughs> I'm glad you wouldn't recognize my pictures back then. My point is, I was saved while I was that bad girl. I was saved, saved, saved by that bad girl. Yes, because what you do flows from... Oh, thank you, sweet. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly... Thank you for adding that because when we love God, it just flows from us. Okay. But our obedience to God is a seal of the righteousness that he gave us when we weren't obeying him. Because we had to understand we were wicked. And then we try with all our heart to obey him because he did save us. And we're still going to mess up. And we still do mess up, okay? So, okay, I hope that makes sense. I think I can leave that. So that he might be the father of all who believe. Right? Abraham isn't just the father of the Jews. We all sang that song. Of, father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had father Abraham. You were one of them. I mean, every church sang that. Every Sunday school changed saying that they should have been in Sabbath school. But the point is, they understood. To Abraham was the blessing, the promises, the covenants by faith. Okay, so your obedience to the Torah is the seal of righteousness of that faith. Okay, 
that he might be the father of all who believe those who are, though, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the faith, which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. That is pretty clear. I don't need to repeat it again. For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. So if it was simply because you were a Jew who were born into the people who kept the law, there's no faith in that. Like there's nothing you need to, then that doesn't work because then you wouldn't need a Messiah. Because if you could just be a Jew and be born and, and be saved because you obeyed the law, then you wouldn't need the promised Messiah that Deuteronomy talks about, right? You need, we have to have the Messiah. We have to have the atoning blood that all the sacrifices in Leviticus point to. Um, it, it would just be like a work. Like you just, a checklist and as long as you do this, you're fine. You have the law, you're a circumcised person, but that's not how God works. Because Abraham... <laughs> was justified while he wasn't obeying the law, before he knew the Torah, before he was circumcised. And then he obeyed as a seal of that. So it's kind of like the consummation of it, right? Okay. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, the Jews, but also to, to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations, Bing. Please go read Genesis chapter 48, verse 16 in the Hebrew. And it literally says, Ephraim will become the Melo Hagoim, the fullness of the Gentiles. Abraham had children. Or Abraham, okay, so you have our father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. One of the sons was Joseph. And exactly, God wants the relationship with you. So one of the sons was Joseph. And Joseph had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And Ephraim was prophesied to become the fullness of the Gentiles. Ephraim became the leader of the northern tribes of Israel. I think a lot of you understand that, but very important there. Okay, so we're on Romans chapter four, establishing that Paul is saying to obey the law. So if you've missed and not followed along from the beginning, I beg you, please go watch from the beginning. Okay. Um, I've made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope, in hope, believed so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He, he like Abraham's like, I just believe, he just believed. God told him this was gonna happen. He just believed even though, he was old and Sarah was old and they couldn't have children. He believed and that was accounted to him for righteousness. And then, I'm not going to leave this off, and then he got circumcised, it says, we just read, as a seal of that. So his obedience was the seal of his faith. Okay. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. So when you believe that the Messiah can cover your sins and forgive you for sin, which is transgression of the law, we just read that in back here a few chapters, a few verses ago, it says, by the law is the knowledge of sin. Okay, hi, Jennifer, shalom. Um, <laughs> right, then we, okay, so by the law is the knowledge of sin. We are not justified that, that we are not saved by that, but our faith in Messiah then leads us to obey. That's how it goes. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Yeshua, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Gentiles. Gentiles. If you had no law, you would have no sin. You would not need a savior. You would not need a blood atonement covering your sins because it says sin is transgression of the law. You would not need a savior. But as we're told in Exodus 12, Numbers 5, Numbers 15, Leviticus 19, you get it. There's one law for any Israelite or Gentile that wants to serve God. The law stands as a witness to point out what is our sin, okay? It does not save us. Okay, so believing in the power of God, the Holy Spirit working in through us to empower us to keep the law. Yes, it is still faith. Believe God can do this exactly. 
Hello, hello, Antoon. Um, okay, we've been going through the Book of Romans. We're in Chapter Five. You might want to, once I post this to my timeline, you'll want to go back and watch the rest if you want to. I guess. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Yeshua Hamashiach, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, this is not talking about the Great Tribulation, but this is kind of talking about the Great Tribulation, right? This applies very much to it. <laughs> we are to rejoice and glory when we have shalom, so when we have tribulations, because those tribulations produce perseverance, perseverance produces character, character produces hope. Because once you've come through it, then you have hope because you see how the Messiah brings you through. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us that in that while we were still sinners breaking the law, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, so we are covered by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. It does not say we aren't going to have tribulations. It literally just said let's glory in hard times, tribulations, persecutions, pers right? Being saved from the wrath means the wrath of the Day of Atonement when he judges the world and he covers us and he judges them. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. So we were enemies. We were sinners. We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. We were still the bad people. We did not have the law. We did not know the law. We did no obedient work. We were justified by faith in him at that point. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through the Lord Yeshua HaMashiach, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, Adam, and death through sin, so because of that sin there is death, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned, for until the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So what he's saying is the law still existed. Do you see that? the Until the law was written, the, the sin... The sin was still there. The, um, the sin was still in the world, but they didn't like always understand it. It's not, it's, it wasn't, it was still imputed because we see that Cain was judged for murdering Abel. We see that there was still punishment for sin, but they didn't, it's like they didn't fully understand it yet. That's why it had to be written down for us so that we could understand it. For until law, sin was in the world. So sin was there. There was a law pointing out the sin, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So it's not that those people before the law was written are guilt free. It's that, is that they just, honestly, they didn't, they had to, okay, let's look about this. So Noah had to hear the voice of God. He was told. He didn't have anything in writing to tell him to take seven clean and two unclean animals. Does that make sense? They had to listen for the voice of God. Um, Enoch walked with God and he would have known. Noah knew to take seven clean and two unclean. So the law stood, the law was there, but there was nothing written that, that they could impute it with. Like it wasn't like a, the, here, here's in writing the code against you. They just had to hear the voice of God and walk with him. And that was obviously, as many of you know, many of you don't probably hear the voice of God in your ear. And think how much Satan is, like Satan talked to Yeshua. Satan, right? How much more is he going to try to deceive us? He tried to talk to Yeshua and said, hey, if you if you just um, bow down to me, I'll give you these kingdoms or whatever, right? Yeshua, Satan talked with him. Like Satan's constantly trying to put thoughts in our head as well that are contrary to the voice of God. That is why we need to know the word of God in the Torah so that we can identify God's voice versus Satan's voice. And so I firmly believe that's why God, when he wrote it down, it was because I believe the wickedness of man was getting so great that the, the ability for us to hear his voice was so much harder. That's what I believe. I believe it was so hard because the sin kept the the... the the web of lies that Satan had woven over us and the spiritual warfare was getting more and more intense. I could be wrong on that one. 
give me your opinions on that part. But that's why I think when it was finally written down was so that codified was because I firmly believe it was getting so hard for humans to hear. <laughs> Even Abraham sinned. He married his sister. But it says he got circumcised, which we know is in the law. So there was parts of it he was hearing, parts of it not. So then God's like, if I just codify this all and write it down for you guys, which he already knew he was going to do, this is the prophesied time it needed to be written down. Does anybody know exactly what year again the law was written? Was that in... Okay, help me out. Was it 3500 BC? Does anybody know? Does anybody remember? I don't know why I forgot that right now. Um, anyway, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. So everybody sinned. I mean, everybody died like Adam, even though they hadn't all done the same sin as Adam, right? Who is a type of him was to come. So Adam is the type of the Messiah. He's a foreshadowing, a prototype. But the free gift is not like the offense. So the offense was eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which brought death into the world. That was the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Yeshua HaMashiach, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one, man, one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. So I want to ask you guys something. Do people still die today? Right? Yep. Those people who try to say the curse is all gone. Nope. People still die. The very first curse put on humans was death. So Jesus' resurrection did not take that curse away yet, but there is a prophesied time when it will be taken away at the resurrection. Does that make sense? The We just read it on Saturday. Now I forgot where it was again. The verse that says the veil that covers the world is death. And that is why Jesus died and rose again. He died and rose again so that his death, and his resurrection would make a way for us to sometime be with him, right? He paid the penalty in the fourth day, the fourth period of a thousand years. He died and rose again, but that curse is still here. It literally says in, is it Revelation? It says, then there will be no curse after Messiah returns, right? After, the, after he returns. After he returns, then there is no curse. But we still have the curse right now, and people still die. That was the very first curse. Very first curse put on man. Shalom, Shala. I miss you. I love you, sweet girl. Um, we're going through Romans. So we're in chapter five. Feel free to go back and watch the rest. It'll be posted to the timeline. Okay. So verse 16. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of the righteousness will reign in life through the one Yeshua HaMashiach. We will. That's a future prophecy. Nobody escapes death yet, <laughs> right? We still have the curse. We are waiting for the resurrection. We're waiting for our new bodies. We're waiting for that time. That's our hope because we know that that faith was sealed with our obedience and that obedience will allow us to hopefully get to eat of the tree of life, like Revelation 22 says. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even though, even so through one man's righteous acts, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Again, guys, it's obedience. What did we read? What did we read? Obedience is the seal of our faith. Obedience is the righteousness that we are to do. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. Listen, but when sin, where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might even through righteousness to eternal life through Yeshua our Lord. I messed up word there. Even so grace might reign through your righteousness to eternal life through Yeshua. Okay, the law entered to point out our sin, to really help us notice our sin. That's when it was written down so we would take note of it because we were obviously weren't listening to the voice of God. <laughs> it made our sin like, 
explode in the face, right? Like we understood then it pointed at it so obviously and glaringly. It, was, it made it so obvious that adultery is wrong. Let's just use that one. It's an easy one. It pointed that sin out. <laughs> like that's what the law did. It's like, that's wrong. That's wrong. And so then everybody could see where they were committing adultery. But where sin abounded, grace abounded more. So where this law is pointing at our sin and what we're doing wrong, here we have this grace found in the Yeshua HaMashiach that when we repent, that means we have to stop from doing it, then we are forgiven. And that grace is much more than the sin. You cannot out sin God's grace, right? You cannot out sin God's grace. Our sin was made blaringly obvious. Is it blaring or glaring? Probably glaring. <laughs> I just realized I kept stumbling on it because my mind's like, this doesn't sound right. I've been up since 3.30. Give me grace. <laughs> so through one, through this law points out the sin, makes it very obvious. And then Yeshua's blood covers that when we repent. We are not content to continue in unrighteous acts. Remember, that's what the judgment and the wrath is coming against, we're told. If we continue in it, we're going to get spanked. That's what we read back in the beginning of Romans. We must turn to righteousness, but we've already messed up. So what do we do? That's what we need our Savior for. We believe in him. We confess our sin to him. He covers that sin. Okay. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? So should I sin on purpose that grace may abound? Because, right, if, well, if, like, I'm, if the law points out my sin and it makes it blaringly, glaringly obvious, well, I should just keep doing that so that Yeshua's grace can abound more. No, 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 no. So we don't sin on purpose. The people coming out of Egypt need the law because they have spent 400 years in the pagan society. Here, I'm just sorry, reading this. In a pagan society and well uh, had us because we live in a multi-pagan world. But if we truly love God, he promises he will write his law on our heart. And because we love him, we want to exactly. And that is the love just when we love our sin. Exactly, exactly, exactly. It is a beautiful relationship. If you love God, you'll keep his commandments. And it's also like we love him because like he saved us. We're so thankful. Like I will share, my, I'm not, I was a wild girl. Like, right. Okay. So my husband, I was so thankful. He fell in love with me. Like, <laughs> like he, <laughs> I partied every night. I drank every night. I was bad, but he loved me. Like he fell in love with me. He adored me. And that, love made me want to just like do so many good things for him. Like I wanted to please him back. And that's what we should do with God. Like God saw us when we were those horrible harlot people. He said, look, I'm going to forgive you. I, I set my son to forgive you. I want to be with you. He gives us that grace and we're supposed to stop doing the harlotry then, right? Okay. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? How much more obvious do I have to be with that? Paul was clear. Paul gets an A++ for his writing right there. <laughs> Good job, Paul. Right, guys? How shall we who died to sin? I didn't die to the law. I died to sin. How should we live any longer in it? If I've been saved, if my faith in Yeshua led me to this obedience and I, that obedience was the seal of that righteousness. I'm not supposed to continue in sin. And it says this, the law by the law is the knowledge of sin. So I must read the law now to understand what it is. And not only do I have to read it now, I got the Holy spirit in here to help me and convict me even more. Or do you not know that as many of us were, as were baptized into Messiah Yeshua were baptized into his death? We died to ourself. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Messiah was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. I'm going to tell you, if you're not obeying the law, you are not walking in newness of life. Because over here, you had no law as a Gentile. There was no law. You weren't doing God's ways. He saved you. So he saved you from being lawless to become lawful. <laughs> Does that make sense? And then that's the newness of life. The old person was without the law. 
the new person has the law. All these laws after your faith, all these laws teach you how to be a holy, set-apart, different person. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. <sighs> what a beautiful thing. Our old man was the sinful, lawless man <laughs> that, the, um, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. How much more obvious is this that we should obey the law? We were slaves of sin. The law was not what we were in bondage to. <laughs> we were in bondage to sin, which is transgression of the law. But if I tried to obey the law without understanding that I was a wicked, wretched person and I needed a savior and a forgiver for that sin, then it's no good. I can't just, I can't be good enough to enter into heaven, right? For we... Oh, I'm sorry, for he who has died has been freed from sin, not from the law. <laughs> when we die to ourself, we're free from sin because the Holy Spirit leads us in obedience. Now, if we have died with Messiah, we believe that we shall also live with him. If we die with him, so if we die to our sin, if we stop sinning, we will rise again and be with him. Knowing that Messiah, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to the dead. I'm sorry, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Yeshua our Lord. So stop sinning. <laughs> once you have that faith in Messiah, you must become a new born again person and there's no separate set of rules. This is right here talking about obedience to the Torah, Romans chapter six. What then? <clears throat> Sorry, verse 12. Therefore do not let sin, which we just defined in, what is it, chapter three? Or is it chapter two? The sin, by the law is the knowledge of sin. So transgression of the law is sin. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Obedience. We, were just, we just read that in chapter one. Obedience to the law is the righteousness. Those are righteous acts. So once you are saved, commit yourself to obedience and be those instruments of righteousness. There is no way you could think that Paul is telling us not to obey the law. What he was saying is that law did not save you and do not boast in the law alone, right? Don't just think you can do the law and then that's good enough and that you're a Jew so you get to be saved. Nope. Okay. And your memory, okay, so for sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under law but under grace. Boom. No way can anybody misquote that scripture anymore <laughs> after today. You are not under law, but under grace. <laughs> it just said. <clears throat> Wait, okay. Listen, we just went in the first three chapters. It said, you are under the law if you're breaking the law. You're not under the law if you're obedient to the law. Christians misuse that verse and then they don't even look at where it's coming from. <laughs> like it's literally coming from the section telling us to obey the law. <laughs> I mean, I'm so berated on some of my posts and I get really fun messages privately from these people. And it's like, they won't look at the scripture. They won't look at the scripture. <laughs> we are not under the law because we are obeying the law. We are not under arrest for breaking the law, so to speak. And that's the way to think of it in English. But we just, please go watch the beginning of this video if you're missing what we just talked about. This is the nail in the coffin that we are to obey the law. And this is where it shows us again, not being, when you're, if it says you're not under the law anymore, that means you're obeying the law. You're not being judged by breaking it. And please go back and listen to the beginning of this <clears throat> to see all that. Does that make sense? Does, there, does anybody have a question on that? Let me just give one minute there because that was a huge one. That was like this whole, the first six chapters of Romans is huge because it establishes without a shadow of a doubt that we are to obey the law, that the law is righteousness, that the law points out our sin. But what it says is you cannot obey the law without faith. 
You must have the faith which produces obedience. And that obedience, it says, is the seal of your righteousness. Abraham believed in God. Then he went and got circumcised after he already had the faith of righteousness. But the circumcision, it says, was the seal of it. Yeah, exactly, Kelly. Is it like, why did they not teach us in church? Like they say, oh, we're not under the law. Right, we're not supposed to be under the law. We're supposed to be obedient to the law because if I'm obeying the law, I'm not under the punishment of the judgment anymore. Okay, verse 15. I don't see anybody having a question, so I'm gonna keep going. What then, shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Okay, so my sins have been forgiven. Okay, is it possible that many are confused by this book because of the audience changing from Greek to Jew? Possibly, possibly, because they're talking, right, because it's written, written in, to Rome, but it was written to the Jews in Rome who were teaching this. Um, I don't know. It makes me angry. Yeah, it does. It's, what we should be angry at is the lies of these false shepherds teaching the lies. We need to really pray for the sheep to come out of these systems. And in, for 20-some years... I'm not a quiet person and I'm not afraid to speak and I really don't give a patootie butt's hoot if anybody's mad at me, right? So, I mean, <laughs> back in 2002, I think I went on every house on my street and put a... <laughs> I sent letters to everybody I knew because I wanted everybody to wake up and know how much God loves them. And um, I think that's what we all should be doing right now more than ever. Like, don't be silent. <laughs> so... When I go to, I'm just going to tell you a funny story. Our town is probably 18,000 people. I share with everybody, everybody, everybody. And I had a big store and my signs were like closed for the Sabbath. <laughs> like any holiday, I would do videos. And anyway, um, I, uh, oh gosh, where was I going with this? Oh, so at the pagan miss time, I'll go to Walmart and I physically share with everybody. I mean, I'm not even joking. <laughs> I'll see somebody with ham and I'll say, did you know, like I used to eat that, but did you know, like God says not to eat it. And like my dad's gout, my dad's um, arthritis and his gout went away within six months. And I just, I mean, I share with everybody. So I go to Walmart at Pagan Miss and there's those checkout lines. And this lady was going around last year and I've been doing this for 23 years. So I haven't moved from this town except for, for a brief time in those years. And the lady goes around and tells everybody, happy, or Mary Pagan Miss. Thank you, Morgan, for that term, by the way. Mary Pagan Miss, Mary Pagan Miss. I won't say the, because it's not Christmas, you know. Anyway, and they get to me and they go, uh, um, uh, uh, okay, ma'am, have a blessed day. Because they know what I'm going to say. If they say Mary Pagan Miss, I'm going to share with them the origins of Pagan Miss. <laughs> so that's what you guys need to do. Turn everybody's heart to God. Hi, Kimberly. You'll want to go back to the beginning of this with Austin, okay? Because um, the first, we went through the first five and a half, or six, we're in the sixth chapter right now. So Kimberly, you'll want to go through this with Austin in just a bit. Um, when he, is he feeling better, by the way? I hope so. I'm praying. Um, I'm going to start back in verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? And we just established that being under the law means we're breaking it. But since we're no longer breaking the law, now should we just go on sinning on purpose? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin, okay, what is sin? Transgression of the law leading to death, or of obedience leading to righteousness? Think you can get any plainer. <laughs> I don't think I need to explain that. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, you were sinners without the law, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Right? I came far from a church that said you could live in sin, not follow Jesus. I know, me too. Jennifer, I like, I drank every single night my sophomore year of high school. My boyfriend was killed in a drunk driving wreck. I well, my ex-boyfriend, we were still friends and we were actually going to go out for a date that weekend. Thank God I didn't go. Um, I mean, I was taught that you could cuss. I was taught that it was okay to smoke. I was taught that it was okay to do lots of bad things. And you're just, because I had a magic pill Jesus formula is what I said. Well, I believed in Jesus, so it was okay. <laughs> that was really scary because I was in danger of hellfire. I mean, oh my gosh, I was in danger. Okay, so in having been set free from sin, not the law, and having been set 
free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. And what did we just say was righteousness? The law. That's like, that's where you're, that's righteousness. That's what we just said. The righteous requirements of the law. Okay, so you're free from sin, which is breaking the law, and now you're a slave of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, without the law, lawlessness means without the law, leaving, okay, leading to more lawlessness, more without the law, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Like, <laughs> I was a teacher. And if I was teaching logic right now, I would be like, without the law was the bad spot. Therefore, the opposite is the good spot, which is with the law. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. Okay. Oh, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Meaning, you're basically going to hell. You're like, it didn't matter anyway. <laughs> you didn't have to do anything of, of righteousness because you're just a slave of sin. Go ahead and do it. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? Right? For the end of those things is death. All of us were bad. Well, maybe some of you weren't as bad as some of us were, but some of us really know the grace of God. But now having been set free from sin, not from the law, you're set free from sin. And having become slaves of God, you, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. If you continue in sin, it's going to be death to you. But the gift of God is eternal life in Yeshua HaMashiach. Praise God, praise God. And when Yeshua said, depart from... Yes, Matthew 7. Matthew 7. You're right. So just so you know, Gina, when in 2001, right before I was coming to Torah, as I was coming, God opened my Bible to Matthew 7 every day. And it, Matthew 7 says, many will come to me in that day. This is Yeshua speaking. Many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many wonders in your name? And it says he will look at them and say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You who do the work of no law. <laughs> it's like you who are against the law. And I would open to that every single day. And I would sit at my stairs for hours and say, Father God, Teach me your ways. Show me where I'm wrong. You're telling me something. I don't know what you're telling me. Please don't send me away. What is it? What is it? And praise God, after 13 days with no food, he got through my thick head. Verse chapter seven. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he... You guys, do you want to stop here? Because that's kind of a long study. <laughs> We've been going for two hours. Um, should we continue this tomorrow night? What do you guys want to do? I'm just going to wait for your response. Do you want to go now? Or do you want to do it tomorrow night? Anybody tell me what's your, what are your, what are your thoughts? I don't need a lot of sleep. I'm a short cycle sleeper. My husband thought something was wrong with me when we got married. <laughs> and he did some research. And then he realized that three hours of sleep is fine for me usually. Um, he's been speaking and literally repeating that verse to me in Matthew 7 over and over and over. Who is that? Let me see. He's been speaking. Okay, Gina. In, yep. Kelly. Yep, that's awesome. Are you judged for assuming you don't really? Yes. So there actually is that. Um, what it says, is it Jeremiah or Isaiah? Like I used to like, I had everything memorized and then I had my store and then so some of these things get jumbled. Um, I think it's Jeremiah, but it says, he who sins without knowledge receives fewer stripes than he who sins with knowledge. There is still a consequence. Um, as a, your father with like, for example, like with the Alzheimer's, oh, that's hard one. It's, it would be up to you then. I guess here's the thing. Usually back in the day, we, you know, the Bible forbids medicine and stuff like that. That's a whole nother can of worms we're not going into right now. But that's pharmacia and stuff. We wouldn't be using doctors. Luke was not a physician. The word there for Luke was the gift of spiritual healing. Everywhere else, it's the same word for gift of spiritual healing. You would be taking care primarily of your father, Jenna, um, in, in, in the biblical way, just like they did Jacob, just like they did anybody else who was elderly. And you would be administering the care, so everything would be kosher, everything would be clean. Um, please, guys... Understand that kosher, I'm just using it in the sense not of rabbinical Judaism because I eat meat and milk together. The only thing it says is not to boil a kid in his mother's milk. And Abraham served God himself. 
with the three angels, curds and meat. So, right? Okay. So I'm not speaking about that. But so, Jenna, then it would be your responsibility, I guess, to keep as much as you could. You, you would keep him in obedience. If he's failing and ailing and not able to do it, then you would make sure his food is clean. You would make sure he's doing what he could. Um, because also, yeah, Alzheimer's is very hard because then they don't have that cognition. So he's not going to be able to make his own choices. But you would help make those choices for him and continue it in. At the same point, I do believe there's a level of like with a child and, and, and perhaps with Alzheimer's, um, right? It's like <laughs> part of it, they're not going to have that cognition of the interaction with God and the relationship part of God. And then that I, you know, I know children I firmly believe are his. I firmly believe that children are Yahweh's. Um, if a child dies and they are not of the age of understanding, I am quite certain they're with the father, right? They go to Abraham's bosom and wait to the resurrection. Um, yeah, tomorrow's good. Okay, perfect, Gina. I think tomorrow's good too. If you sinned and repented and later repeat that same sin and once we... Okay, so let's look at this example. David knew it was wrong to have an affair with Bathsheba. He slept with her, got her pregnant, and then to cover that up, he did more sin. He put Uriah at the front of the battle and killed him. And guess what? He received forgiveness. So when the Bible says there is no sin, no offering for purposeful sin, what happened to David? David's son was killed. There was forgiveness, but there was no payment that took away the punishment. So what you got to think about is this way. David sinned on purpose. And like the book of Hebrews says, therefore there was a, there was a certain expectation of judgment. And what happened to David? He lost his son and Absalom rebelled against him. There was an uprising within his own family. So he had a consequential punishment because he knew better. If you sin on purpose, that's what those sacrifices were to teach us what Yeshua's blood was for. The sacrifices never did it. The offerings never did it. It was Yeshua's blood. Yeshua's blood is to cover any accidental sin you do. And that's what it talks about. If you accidentally sin, you're like, oh my goodness, I messed up. And that's what it even says like... um. Yeah, like sins you're just not aware of, right? However, when you know something's wrong, you can still be forgiven, but you're going to get a spanking. So like if you do a purposeful sin and then you realize, oh my gosh, what did I do? Now you can't do this. You can't say, I'm going to go sin on purpose and then I'm just going to like, it's fine. And then never be sorry for it. Because then how is that for you can't, how can you get forgiven for that? Because you're not sorry for it, right? You didn't turn from it. But for example, um, I'm trying to think, I don't really, I'm not, I am not a person who sins on purpose. Um, so if I know it's wrong, I just won't do it. Now, every once in a while, if I'm frustrated at an animal, I don't, like I used to cuss like a trucker. And the, when I got saved and born again, it was like no more cussing. I will say accidentally, if a cow steps on my foot or pushes me over, I might say a, something that I'm not pleased with and that, and I have to repent and I'm so sorry to God. That's not purposeful. If I did it on purpose and it's like, I don't care, I'm going to say it anyway, then I'd get a spanking, <laughs> right? So if I didn't, no, but I, both times I knew it was sin. The one was more in the sin of passion. <laughs> when you're trying not to die from a cow stepping on you. <laughs> So I don't know. Was this experience? Yes, <laughs> I should. But I always say sorry. So my point is, but when I didn't know it was sin to eat shellfish, do you know I almost died still? Let me tell you this. So when my son was two weeks old, I had crab legs. My family's Jewish. Like, how stupid can I be? But my grandma was called a dirty little Jew, but we were raised very mainstream Christian. So I didn't even know what Jew meant. I didn't even know that Saturday was a Sabbath. I just literally had no idea. Um, but I guess my Aunt Lizzie would always tell my dad we're Jewish. And like, I don't know. I didn't even know what that meant. I honestly just was so, let me smoke a joint. Let me smoke a cigarette, whatever. <laughs> I don't know. I was just in my own stupid, clueless, sinful world. Um, but when I ate shellfish, I did not know it was wrong. And my throat closed. And I went to anaphylactic allergic reaction. I didn't know any better. I went to the doctor. And they said I had 30 minutes left to live. I was terrified. I had a two-week-old baby. And I heard the voice of God. He said, he said, I told you my word not to eat this. And I'm like, well, I thought we could eat anything now. <laughs> like, here I am dying. I'm like, just, I'll, just please save me, God. I mean, I want to see my son. Like, please help me. I have a two-week-old baby. Save me. 
I still got a punishment for it. Like I was still, I did not know it was sin to eat shellfish because I was with that excuse because all I had to do was open the word and I didn't, right? So I still got a punishment. However, I believe that he spared me because it was an accidental, I didn't understand the commandments at the time. Now, if I went and ate shellfish, I'm gonna get in big trouble <laughs> because I know no. Does that make sense? So there's still forgiveness, but but let's say this, let's say I just do something stupid and I go eat shellfish and then I'm like cut to the heart like David was. I'm like, oh my gosh, <gasps> what did I do? And then I can be forgiven with a consequence. Okay, follow the law because you were, exactly. That's a great way to put it, Carissa. You need rest, I'm good tomorrow. Yeah, well, I don't need rest. I don't sleep a lot, but yeah, I do think we should do tomorrow. 70 by seven, exactly, we forgive. He doesn't understand who Abba or she, he, yes. Okay, so yes, he might not understand part of the Torah, but what I've done, Jenna, okay, I had a member of the family who I was sent to go see that was medicated very heavily that day. I knew it. And this person had rejected Torah in obedience. And I was sent there and I prayed. <laughs> I said, Father God, then I need you please to let all of the family be out of the room so I'm not hated and I can just like be gentle and kind and loving because I'll start crying. I'm, <laughs> I seem strong, but I'm not mean and I'm not a fighter. So like I'm very determined and dedicated to my God, but if you're gonna fight me, I'm just gonna start shaking and cry. Like I don't do it, I don't fight. <laughs> so like I'll just literally, if you just, I'm just like, ah, I, I don't fight, I do not fight. I do not fight, I do not fight. And so, I knew that people started screaming at me and yelling at me that has happened and calling me names and stuff. Like I can usually just keep it calm if it's, but I don't, <laughs> but if it's my family, it's like, I love them so much. So then I cry. If it isn't, I've had, I've had so many people scream at me that are not family that I just stay calm and smiling and I'm just, that's fine. Anyway, so I prayed God to get him out of the room. And so I'm sorry, that was so long, Jenna. Um, what I prayed though, I said, Father God, give her clarity of mind. Let all the drugs get out of her system and let me know she's comprehending. And I tell you what, she was as clear headed as could be. So just pray. Pray that God gives you that moment and that because God can heal. I lay I <laughs> laid hands on somebody recently who was healed again. Um, I just prayed for somebody today, and as I was praying, I have it was the most amazing. I had my hand on the phone, praying with this girl, and my hand like lit on fire, and I felt like whoosh, spirit go through. And I was like, I'm not. I know, I know that spirit's going to her. So pray because he's with you. The same spirit's in you that's in me. Pray. Lay hands on your father. Pray for that healing. Pray for his mind to be set free. And then just beg God for that time to have it. That's what I would do. I, I, Everything I do is in faith. I haven't gone to a doctor in over 20 years. Everything I do is my faith is in God. And I've seen great miracles because of that faith in him. And so you have that faith because you have the same spirit. Um, you have to get to sleep, Kelly. Okay, good. Yes, thank you for this explanation of the purposeful sin. Um, what is the spanking you're talking about? Okay, so the spanking like can be different things. Um, sickness disease, broken bones, um, financial troubles, right? So Paul was struck blind. His spanking, because he was fighting who Yeshua was, God came and paddled his behind, and he had blinders or scales on his eyes or whatever it was, right? And he fasted for three nights and three days, and then those scales fell off, by the way, from Ananias, who was sent to him, who was a devout man according to the law. It says it twice, devout man according to the law. Why would you send somebody who obeys the law to give you your sight into the gospel if the law was done away with? Why would you even mention that? Isn't that awesome? Um, and so the spankings are all sorts of things. So anytime something happens to me, I'm immediately like, okay, God, what did I do? Right? Um, should I tell some of my spankings? Sometimes I don't like to do, like things. Um, I've, <laughs> I'm trying to think of one that I don't want to incriminate anybody else. <laughs> if I've, um, so I'm trying to just be really careful. Um, 
Yeah, I've I've known like people who when their eyes start failing, for me, if my eyes sometimes fog up that day, I'll be like, uh-oh, was I short-sighted unto blindness? Meaning, did I forget my sins that I was cleansed of and am I being judgmental to somebody? Um, I've had somebody, yeah, there's all sorts of things that he can do. So sometimes you'll have, like you'll lose money or you won't have, um, you won't get paid by somebody if you were, I've just seen people who didn't get paid when they were being unfaithful to somebody. I've seen, I had a, a person, yeah, that falsely accused me very badly in my husband and he died at age 39, a very gruesome death. That was a huge spanking suit. But spanking can be all sorts of things. So I hope that makes sense. I'm sorry. Um, God disciplines us. So never run to a doctor when you're sick because everything came through God's hands. So if you're sick, it could be like Job where he's testing your faith and making you stronger in obedience to him. And, and he might be just trying to get you to curse. Like Satan might just be trying to get you to curse God. You just stay faithful. Or what if it's like Paul? Like he, Paul had to get his attention like he was sinning. He was coming against who Yeshua was. And so I hope that made sense. Um, I just replace those words with salty language alert. I curse like a sailor. Yeah. Sometimes I, ha yes. Okay. So I used to, it was such a night and day thing. I'm so thankful that Yahweh delivered me from that demon because it is a demon. He showed me very clearly one day because I knew because this, um, I opened my mouth and it wasn't me speaking and I heard the words come out. I was like, Ooh, and Yahweh says, you better overcome that demon. And I did. Um, I do. I don't. I'm just not a cusser. It's just every once in a while I've messed up and that's what I have to say sorry for. Um, thank you, thank you. Well, yeah, God bless you. Um, and then tomorrow night, let's do, we'll do it again. Um, good for you, Gina. Um, and we'll let's meet again tomorrow night. So please, if you're just joining or did not catch the first part, we went through Romans chapters one through six. It was a great study. It clearly shows that we are still supposed to obey the law, but the law doesn't save you. It is faith in Jesus, Yeshua alone, which leads to that righteous act of obedience. Nothing else. Like we're only saved by faith in Jesus. Um, this is so off course, but Matthew 7, yep, you'll know them by their fruits. Yes, overcome the demon. Yeah, well, um, okay, guys, this tomorrow night, we'll continue chapter 7 to the end, and then... Remember, if you are confused about Galatians, please go to my podcast, God's Little Hummingbird. That one I did get into podcast form, and um, it really answers and shows you how very clearly Galatians is not saying not to obey. It's, if you break it down, like you see how when we went through this very succinctly today, you can't think this says not to obey the law. If you take things out of context, you could, but if you read the whole thing, it's so clear. <laughs> it is so crystal clear. Anyway, it's beautiful. Um, shalom to you all. Much love to you. Many blessings. What time do we start tomorrow? Um, let's see. I could start earlier tomorrow. Um, what time works for you guys? <laughs> Honestly, just throw it out here. I'm mountain time. So I'm mountain standard time. So right now it is 1113 here. Um, I have a photo session from 10 to 2 tomorrow. And then I'm talking, I have an appointment in the afternoon. Yeah, so I think, let's see, I have to bring cows in at 6. So I could potentially do it at like 7.30 or 8 my time. Does that work? If I say like 8 o'clock, if I say 8 Mountain Standard Time tomorrow, does that work? Let me make a note <laughs> so I don't forget. Okay, I'll say, okay, I have a pen somewhere. Um, we'll say 8 p.m. tomorrow. Please bring your questions. And then if there's another book, because what I do these, what I, when the Lord, okay, I've been very vocal for 20 some years. So it's 1.13. Oh, where are you at, Nellie? Yes, Kelly, that was, we were going to talk tomorrow. So, okay, Kelly, Let's talk tomorrow at seven my time. Does that work? And then I'll do the Zoom. This this is not Zoom. This is whatever. So eight, I'm going to make a note. Put it on my calendar and I can't forget because I have that. Okay, newborn session tomorrow and then 8 p.m. live. And then Kelly, I'm writing you on the schedule too. Um, and then I'll just call you tomorrow, FaceTime you. Um, okay, and then I have another meeting too. So... 
think about your other books you want to do, um, 7.30 in the morning. Okay, because you're in Croatia, correct, Antun? Um, the reason I started making these reels, because we've always taught. My husband and I started teaching back in 2002, the Torah to people, very local. We I didn't want to do the, I hate FaceTime. Um, or Facebook and stuff. But I felt the Lord tell me this last year to start doing these reels. And so I obeyed because I made the podcast for a couple years now. Um, and then, but what I'm doing is I'm trying to help most of you um, have the answers because like I've had people reach out all day. You understand a lot of you, but a lot of you just don't know the scriptures like I do yet because you're coming out, you see the Babylonian system airs, but sometimes you don't have those quick answers for the people coming at you and the people coming against you. Like I have a lady, is she on here? I don't think so. Taryn, are you on here? Anyway, um, in the UK, she has all these people coming against her, but she knows what the Bible says, but she doesn't know how it all pieces together. And I pretty much have the Bible usually memorized. That's you know what I prayed 20 some years ago? I said, Father God, just sear your heart on my, sear your word on my heart. Let me just know every word. <laughs> so usually I can pretty much, it is. That's what he seared on my heart. Anyway, the point is I'm trying to give you guys the tools so when people come at you with their um, antinomian constructs that you have the quick answer. And so the book of the book of Galatians is really important. Please go to the podcast. It says, um, it's God's little hummingbird. It's Galatians, all six chapters, and then we're gonna. I'm going through Romans on here, and then I will put this in podcast form. But these are the things that where they're lost in error and they don't understand. These are the things they try to take out of context and twist. So if I can give you those tools, and that's what my reels are, are the tools. If you notice, I typically take a point where Christians are teaching something, and I show them where that's not biblical because we want to help them understand. But more than that, I'm trying to help you guys understand how to answer them when they come at you with this. Um, and be careful because spiritual warfare is real. When I was, um, did I say we were going and I'm keep talking here? I remember, you got to remember back in 2000, that was the first awakening of Ephraim. That was the first group of people really awakening to who they were in Israel. In fact, we had the dream, and I've told you this before, like Bachu in my dream, it was like Bacha, Eddie Chumney, Monte Judah, those three, some of those people had gone on the road before us. So they were laying the groundwork for the railroad track. My husband and I were then next and there was no railroad track yet, but the dirt had been laid. You know how a railroad track has that firm gravel base? We were walking and we had to walk with backpacks on because there was no train yet and the tracks had not been laid. In a long time after us, which ended up being like 10 years, the, the railroad tracks were laid and finally I saw the trains filled with God's people bringing them. And another person at the same time in the, of, of our fellowship had a, a dream where us, like her and us and a few other people were waiting in this lighthouse and we had to wait a very long time. <laughs> and it's true, we had to wait like 10 years for that second group of Ephraim to come. Um, and so like 20 years ago when we first came to Torah, there was like nobody else to talk to about this. There was like, so all of us, I think in the world that were coming to Torah 20 years ago knew each other because it was like, I had this friend in Amsterdam. She's like, I just like was told I was a Friam, which had happened to me. I was like, I just kept, God kept telling me, I was like, I don't know what a Friam means, God. Like, what are you saying? <laughs> and then he kept saying, you're a Levite. And I'm like, what? I literally was so confused. And so I just try to give you guys the tools because we didn't have that. And it was like, oh, okay. So any other questions? I haven't been to doctor. Good job. This is off course. Yes. Overcome this demon. Okay. 8 p.m. tomorrow. Did I get all these questions? My husband. Yes. We're going to talk to him. That works. Thank you. Here's time. So you okay. Perfect. Oh, you're in New Jersey. Oh yeah. So it's 119. I was in. Okay, shalom, guys. I think I totally didn't finish the thought I was going to finish, but that's what happens when you're up at 3.30. Yavi bless you all. Sleep tight. Have a good night.